Good morning. Good morning. John has arrived. I was praying that you just might show up today. Praise the Lord. So a few announcements. The Operation Christmas Child work is underway. So bring your gifts to the church. And the children will help pack the shoeboxes during the Sunday school hour on November 12th. Um, if you want to pack one yourself, please take a box and do that. Otherwise, bring all your gifts to the church, and we'll pack them up here. If you haven't heard, Margaret and Mike's and his brother Bob has passed away. And I called them on Thursday, Margaret and Bob, and they were kind of reeling because of what's happened with Crystal and uh, his brother. I think today they're traveling to the funeral, I think. I'm no, guessing they are. No, they plan on to go. Oh. Okay, so we need to keep praying for them. Um, and then John, I know you're praying for him. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for everybody else praying. I really appreciate it. And, uh, it's all in God's good grace, all your prayers that uh, things turned out the way you guys saw. That's glorious. Amen. Amen. So praise God for that work you did. Sunday school continues after worship, so please be in prayer that God's plans are established. The adult sapship study is underway, so I invited Ray to join me in that study. So please pray. And he seemed open, like 78% open. <laughs> so, so just pray that God can work on him and get him. It'd be so cool to bond with him and get to know him and, and just walk. And through that study with him. So pray about Ray and his family. Um, and speaking of prayer, if you have a prayer request, please let me know. Please let me know. Prayer, I think, is becoming so important for us in this church. There's so many things happening, both good and sad. So please, please, let's keep praying. Together, as a team, whatever, whatever it is, please keep praying. Next week, Kevin Fever's going to be here. Um, I've seen the list of songs, and I, I can't wait. It's going to be amazing. Um, and then the following uh, uh, Sunday, October 15th, Pastor Enrique is going to be here because we're on vacation. So I sent him the readings for that Sunday, and he's working on the message already. And I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. So please, please be here for that. So this... Thursday, we became residents of Ellendale. Friday, Friday, we bought a house. Yeah. So we're going to that. Wow. God, he's working and working. He's working for all of us. He's working. So I praise him for that. So that's all I have for announcements. Let's greet each other with the peace of Christ. Mm -hmm. This first psalm is a, uh, this first uh, hymn is a prayer. So let's just pray up with all of our hearts to the Lord.
and the sin of Christ. Amen. Let's approach our Father. Let's be the Holy Trinity, one God. Seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the kingdom of heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullest confidence, that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help the hour of need. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God. Let us approach the throne of God's everlasting kingdom. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us the perfect law of Moses and the authoritative teachings of Jesus to direct us in the way of life on your paths. You offer us your Holy Spirit so that we can be born to new life as your children. Yet, oh God, we confess that the ways of death are so of attraction and that you want us to come to their lure. Give us the vision and courage to choose that nurture life, and we receive your generous blessings. Amen. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for your great salvation. Amen. Amen. The crowds were astonished teaching of Jesus Christ, for he was teaching them as one who has authority. Praise to you, O God, our Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray together now in Jesus' name. Eternal God, King of glory, you have exalted your soul to great triumph to be Lord of all. You have us that comfort us by sending the Holy Spirit to strengthen us, that we may labor for the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ, you love your disciples, that you must send the Holy Spirit to be our advocate. Grant us the spirit of truth to convince the world that you are risen from the dead. Eternal God, you have given your son authority in heaven and on earth. Grant that we may never lose the vision of his kingdom, the servant of hope and joy. Amen. Amen. It's time for our scripture readings. Our first reading today is from Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. And 25 through 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Yet you say, the word of the Lord is not just. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall save his life. Because he considered and turned away from all the transgressions that he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? 
Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. The word of the Lord. Thank you, uh, the psalm today is 25, verses 1 through 10. We'll read it responsibly. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, I am you in my trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let me not my enemies be over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantingly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, to teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. For the upright is the Lord. Therefore, he starts sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness, for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And please rise for the gospel. The gospel today is Matthew 21, verses 23 through 32. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question. And if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And when he went to the other son, he said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Would the children today for a message or a teaching? Please come out up. Morning. Here comes the young man right here. All right. Is there room for you? Is there room? All right. So what? When I say the word authority, what do you think about? Is it a bad word or a good word? Is it a hard word or an easy word? So Jesus has been given all authority. Isn't that cool? Do you know what that means? He, he, he is a ruler of all. He cares deeply for all creation. He cares for creation the best of anyone. He cares for us. He cares for us the best. His compassion is unending. He teaches us with great skill. So authority is actually a good word. So if your mom and dad have authority over you, you know that? But it's a good word. Because they deeply care about you. 
care about you. They care about who you are. They care about your future. They care about your health. So when they speak to you and give you a teaching, you should listen. Okay? If you have questions, it's great to ask questions to get clarity and understanding. Does that make sense? So when you hear authority, think of it as a really good word. It's a life-giving word. When your mom says, I have authority over you, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. When your dad says that to you, or your grandpa, or any family member says that to you, it's a blessing. So receive it as a blessing. Does that make sense? Can you do that for me? Honor your parents and your grandparents or your mom and dad and listen to their authority and respect their authority. But most of all, respect the authority of Jesus. Because he really loves you. Can you hear that? Is that in your heart? Do you feel it? It's very important that you understand that. Okay. Good job listening. I'm proud of you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Reading, Jesus came into town in Jerusalem and cursed the fig tree. It could be a metaphor, it could be a metaphor for the remnant in Jerusalem, the people of Judah, or a metaphor for the temple leadership who are not bearing the fruit of the living God. Everyone is put under the curse of the law in Deuteronomy. That is Paul's point in his letter to the Galatians. Everyone falls short. But the blind and the lame have no difficulty with the message of Jesus because they knew they fell short. But the ones who were cursed because they believe that they are fine, that they are living in the city, that their grocery stores are full, they have all they need, and the temple is running smoothly. Instead of questioning their own behavior and examining their own conscience before God, the temple leadership chose instead to question the authority of God's messenger, God's greatest revelation of all time, Jesus Christ our Lord. At the beginning of chapter 1, the people were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the Son of David, which upset the priests and the scribes. Then we have the cleansing of the temple, which upset the priests and the scribes. Then Jesus began to teach in the temple, and the priests and the elders were upset because they, were, they wondered, who are you to be teaching these things? I think in the background of this scripture, Jesus seems to be asking the temple leadership, where is the fruit? Where is the faith in God? No faith, no fruit, this is the problem. Yes, you have zeal for the temple, and zeal against Jesus. This zeal against Jesus is not because of their faith, it's because, because of the lack of faith. They cannot hear the teaching. They can't hear Hosanna to the Son of David because of their zeal. But the zeal of the temple leadership 
and the true faith of God are opposed to each other. Faith, fruit, and zeal seems to me this is a recipe for church health and building the temple community on the rock of the teaching of Jesus. We'll start in verse 23 in chapter 21. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elder of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? The temple leadership is asking Jesus this question, Who is in charge here, me or you? But I wonder if the better question is, What does Scripture say? We're all under scripture. We are all under the teaching of Jesus, the authoritative teaching of Jesus Christ. The chief priests and the elders exercised authority over the people, supported by Rome. But they have no idea. They are asking the Son of the living God, who took on flesh, the salvation of the world, by what authority are you doing these things. They're asking for his credentials. It seems they are trying to protect the people from charismatic false teachers and protecting the temple. But maybe I'm giving them too much credit. They seem to think that Jesus is a street preacher, maybe an up and coming rabbi, but nothing else. So Jesus here enters. The temple for the last time. This is Holy Week. This is Holy Week we're in right now in, in the text. And he's challenged by the high priest, by the temple leadership, who will eventually plot his death and will sit in judgment on him, on Jesus. So authority is a big idea in Matthew. It's a big idea in his presentation of Jesus. Jesus is recognized by the crowds to teach with authority. In chapter 7, he has authority to heal, even at a distance. Chapter 8, he has authority to forgive sins and confers that authority upon his disciples. Chapter 9, chapter 10, Jesus declares that God has given him all authority, including the authority to teach. Chapter 28. But the leadership in the temple are not protecting the teaching. They should be under the teaching. Jesus is under the teaching. Their zeal to protect the teaching is an affront for their ego that thinks they are over the text and protecting the text instead of being under the text and serving the text. Jesus answered them in verse 24, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or man? So we all know that Jewish teachers often counter questions with questions. By mentioning John the Baptist, Jesus evokes the picture of the stream of prophets in Israel's history, the authentic bearers of God's word, although rejected and killed by the people's leaders. Jesus identifies John and himself with this succession of prophets, but his opponents teaching is of human origin. They don't teach with God-given authority, but they advocate human tradition. So Jesus says, what do you say about John? Did you judge John according to the scripture? They simply could not figure out John or Jesus. They could not sort out the teaching of John or Jesus. But the truth seems to be they didn't care about the teaching. They only care about power. In U.S. politics, both sides pray to the same God and assume that God is on their side. They only want God to be on their side. They don't want to be on the side of God. The temple leadership think 
when this guy, Jesus, is against us, and we on the side of God, then he must be against us and against God. But are they on God's side? We have to remember we cannot always assume that we are on God's side. We hope that we serve this gospel message of the kingdom in the truest and most humblest way. Then they discussed it among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? If we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John is a prophet. It still seems that the chief priests and elders do not have a concern for the truth. They think over their alternatives. Jesus knows their thoughts. It's important for Matthew to show that the leaders are influenced by the crowd's opinion. Since they seek popularity and are actually jealous of Jesus. See chapter 27 of Matthew. Jesus knew their silent thoughts. He knows our silent thoughts. The temple in Jerusalem was in decent health this time under Roman authority. There was no shortage of crowds in the temple to support the temple. But it's the job of the temple leadership to build the temple complex to make it thrive? Or is the job of the temple leadership to teach the teaching and deliver the message to Jerusalem so that when they are judged, they have no excuse? The answer is B, that B does not look good on a battle sheet. The preacher needs to realize that God's word is not the preacher's word. He needs to recognize himself as a messenger, not an originator, a sower, not a source, a herald, not the authority, a steward, but not the owner, a guide, but not the author, a server of spiritual food, but not the chef. This right here is not a human enterprise. I must deliver God's message correctly and well so that people understand and respond to the fact that the judgment is coming so they have no excuse. Verse 27. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you what authority I do these things. All they could answer was, We don't know. Jesus' question revealed the motivation of these leaders and exposed them for what they really are hypocrites. They indicted themselves when they cited only two options and chose neither. We don't know. <coughs> the point is, whatever Jesus said in response to their question, they were not going to believe it, and would in the end use the answer against him. This was their strategy to trap Jesus, but now it seems they've fallen into the trap. So I want to be clear, teachers of theology and preachers and Bible study leaders, they have no commission to know all the answers. Even disciples who have been given the mysteries of the kingdom do not know the end time secrets and should not claim to know more than they do. So we do not know can be a very Christian confession of faith, but not in this story. The temple leadership are confronted with the different ministries of John and Jesus. They had in fact rejected both as authentic messengers of, from God. And they take refuge in the answer we don't know. For those who want to do God's will can and must know that the message of Christ comes from God. So this story, this text, puts John and Jesus in the same category. Those who reject 
John also reject Jesus. Their question about Jesus' authority is not is restated, but not avoided. Both are from God, yet they are very different. John wavered and wondered, chapter 11, while Jesus spoke with unrelenting authority. Then he gives his parable. So what do you think? A man had two sons. And he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. So father to son, get it done. The vineyard is a metaphor for the work that needs to be done on behalf of the landowner who is God. The chief priests and the elders have a job in the vineyard. Jesus is doing the work of the vineyard. The temple leadership seems to think, well, who is he to come into our vineyard and do the work? Father to son, get it done. So the Jewish culture demanded that sons honor and obey and answer their fathers respectfully. The minor sons often worked on the farm or learned the trade from their father. Verse 29. And Jesus answered on and son. So the son answered, I will not go. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. Another English translation, the boy answered, I will not, but later he had a change of heart and went. So the Greek word behind this change of heart is to change one's mind about something with a probable implication of regret. So the son seems to regret his initial response. Ultimately, this son's actions will reflect the commandment. He finally aligned his will to the father and got to work. He aligned not only his will in his heart and mind, but in his actions. He went out and did the work that the Father had commanded. But what do we do with his initial disobedience? Would Jesus hold the Son up as an example for us, as an example of righteousness? Verse 30. And the father went to the other son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. So these two sons, the first, did not give lip service. And then he finally had a change of heart, a change in priorities. And the second said, I will do it, and did not go. That sounds like lip service. So the Greek translation of this verse is really awesome. So the son's answer in the Greek for I go, sir, a better translation, I go, Lord. This reminds me of Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus is not some corporate executive who wants to hear how great he is so you can advance your career. It does not work this way. This might work in other arenas or other lords, but with this Lord, Jesus Christ, he is not impressed when you tell people how much you love him. He wants to see what you're going to do when he says to get it done. So this is not a fairy tale about a vineyard. Verse 31, Jesus asked this question. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. So Jesus does not say, you gave the correct answer. He does not say, you're absolutely correct. So one of the ideas from Matthew in chapter 29 is the teaching about the dangers of giving lip service to God. People get on TV and talk about how much they love Jesus, but that display of emotion has little connection to how they live their lives. We're all familiar with this hypocrisy, because this hypocrisy lives in all of us, including me. The will of the Father. I sat with that phrase for a lot this, this week. The will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? If you are not sure, Read the Bible. Study the scriptures. This is the will 
of the Father. So it seems that Jesus is saying the tax collectors and the prostitutes are doing the will of the Father. It seems they are going out into the vineyard and doing the work that the Father needs done. At first, the tax collectors and the prostitutes did not did their own thing against the will of God, but then they finally follow Jesus in order to follow the teaching that he was bringing. They were coming to listen at his feet so they could go and act differently, to repent so they will become citizens of his kingdom of heaven. They were willing to do the work, even though they had rejected the true teaching at first, but then they realized they were blind and realized I will do what it takes to see. It's a tough leadership. They talked a good talk, but did not perform the work. They said, yes, Lord, and did not do the work. So Jesus is not putting the tax collectors and the prostitutes on it, or the weak, or the disadvantaged, or the broken on a pedestal. I don't think he's doing that. I think if we put them on a pedestal, then you might think the goal of Scripture is to make you weak and disadvantaged like them. The real value of the outsiders, of the weak and disadvantaged, of the tax collectors and prostitutes, is they're not on a pedestal. And they know they're in a lowly position, and they are dependent upon God because of that. Therefore, they do what he says. That's the key. They do what God says. Verse 32. John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. Tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe John. In Matthew, the blind own their blindness. The chief priests are blind. They do not own their blindness. John came to us on the path of righteousness, walking toward the kingdom of heaven. The tax collectors and the prostitutes see John walking in the way of righteousness, and they believed him. They are saying, I don't like this path I am on, this tax collector path, this prostitute path. It's a terrible path. I don't like it. John, I trust you. You are a better path. I'm going to follow you. But the temple leadership, they like their path. Therefore, they couldn't believe John or Jesus. They never cared about the path that John was on. They only cared about their own agenda, their own path. But only John's path will take you to the kingdom of heaven. You pick another path, it might lead to hell. And John's path is repentance, repentance, repentance. Jesus, I think, is comparing religious leaders to the disobedient son. So I forgot about this. So back in chapter 3 of Matthew, Jerusalem went to John, including the Pharisees and Sadducees. They went out to hear John preach. But the Pharisees and Sadducees did not accept the message. So who are these two sons? It really seems like neither of these sons were impressive. Or they seemed to be fully in line with the will of their father. We know both of these sons. We are both of these sons. Our churches are filled with both of these sons. The ones who say they will go and don't, and the one who says no, and then seems to repent and gets to work. I am both of these sons, a double-minded sinner. So this relationship between his father and his two sons is broken. Both of them is broken. And that's who we are, people like you and me. 
whose every inclination is disobedience. The chronic inclination, it seems, to destruction. Sometimes we cover it up better than other times, but it's always there. But the good news, there's this other son, this unique and one of kind son, Jesus Christ, who knows the will of the Father, who loves the Father, who never turns away from the Father's will in favor of his own. He is the one who is faithful, even to the point of death. He is the one that leads the way into God's kingdom of heaven. Because of the authority of Jesus, and because we are under his authority, even though we wrestle with that authority almost every day, because of his authority, his righteousness is ours. His faithfulness is ours. His obedience is ours. His connection with the living God is our salvation. It's by his authority as the one who remained faithful to the end that Jesus speaks this day to us. Now enter into the house of my Father. So don't measure yourself against these two sons or your neighbor with some imagined standard of holiness. When your father looks, when your father looks upon you, he does not see the first son or the second son, he sees the one true son. And it's his mark that is upon you and within you. It's his faithfulness that carries you through your doubt and disobedience. It's his mercy that's been extended to you. It's his righteousness that covers our rebellion. So the question is not which son are we? A better question is, who is your father? And the answer is that God is God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is our Father. And the love that the Father has for Jesus, He has for you. You are the beloved child, the one for who Christ died. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, you are awesome with your teaching, with your scripture. Father God, it's powerful. It's life-giving. The teaching is, it's a matrix of ideas that just keep building, Father God. I just thank you for this gift. Thank you for the time we spend in your word, Father God. It is life. It is it is like a new DNA, Father God, that rebuilds our DNA, rebuilds our mind, rebuilds our hearts, Father God. So we can live into the destiny with you, Father God. I thank you for your mighty work. I thank you for how you worked in John's life this week, Father God. I thank you that you're with Marvin and Val in their grief. Thank you, Father, that you're with us. Thank you that you're in this place. Thank you that you're building this church. Thank you that you have authority over us. Let us accept that authority. Let us enjoy that authority, that protection, that purest love, Father, that you give us. Because you are the only one with authority. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your great compassion, your consistent love, and your never-ending mercy. You're a mighty God, and your Son, Jesus, is faithful and true, even through death. Thank you for these teachings. Let it soak into us. Let it fill our hearts and minds, Father God. We so enjoy hearing your word. We so enjoy listening to your word, Father God. Please keep speaking because we are listening. Thank you, Father. We love you. And we need you, desperately need you, Father God. We pray in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Lord, thank you for Pastor Scott's message today, helping us to set our minds on the authority of Jesus through the parable, through the authority of Jesus and through the parable of the two sons. Lord, help us not to have hard hearts and closed ears to your message of truth like the Jewish leaders, giving an appearance of saying yes to God, but in, inwardly trying to be over you instead of being under you. Soften our hearts and unstop our ears to hear your message and truly repent and become obedient in following you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord, be with all gathered today at Christopher Goldman's funeral and for all who are joining through prayer and spirit. Comfort them and bring them your peace. Especially be with her husband Dan and her children Griffin and Charlie and her parents Marcia and John. Lord, we give thanks that you drew Crystal into a loving relationship with you and that she walked faithfully with you daily. And we rejoice in knowing that she has joined you in the home that you prepared for her. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Father God, thank you for the care you provided for John Ingleson this week bringing him safely through his medical procedures and perform, bringing comfort and peace to his family and friends as we all prayed for his healing. Thank you for being our great physician, our Jehovah Rafi. You are our healer. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for the home you have provided for Pastor Scott and Lisa. Thank you for bringing them smoothly through the signing of the final papers this past Friday and giving them clear ownership. We know they will honor and glorify you in that space and in that town. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, thank you for a successful start of our Sunday school year. Pour out your blessings on our Sunday school leadership and give them clear vision in how to continue to bring your words to the children of this church week after week, helping to grow them to become your disciples. Lord, in your mercy. Father, may every aspect of who we are and how we live be under the control of the Holy Spirit. We submit to you now in Jesus' name. May our lives be so controlled by your Holy Spirit that we truly live and move and have our very being in you alone. Help us this day to not indulge in our fleshly nature. Strengthen us to stand firm and be self-controlled in thought, word, and action, that we might be a usable, noble vessel for your purposes and the glory of your great name. Lord, in your mercy. For those who are grieving, Marvin and Bev Meitzner, Marcia and Jim, and family and friends, Crystal Goldman's husband and children, and the Bob Meitzner family, Lord, in your mercy. For those who are recovering from surgery, John Eagleson, Gary Schwartz, Lisa Borcher, Mason, Mason Minor, and Kelsey and Twyla. Those who are working through the challenging process of outpatient rehab, Jaya Fever. Progress is occurring, Lord. We also pray for her support network, family, friends, and medical professionals. Lord, in your mercy. Those experiencing health concerns, Carol Wilker, Mary Arfman, Pastor Sandy. Those who are in need of continued healing and wholeness, Bobby Thompson, Gary Schwartz, Thelma Sahanik, Dee Dee Hilker, Don Ingleson, Jean and Audrey Larson, Sylvia Smuland, Leroy Dirks, Meryl Jensen, Bev Meissner, Cheryl Harlicker, Andrea Thompson, Doug Dirks, Millie and Joe Gill, John Engelson. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who we serve at Laundry Love. We lift them to you, Lord. They need you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We pray that all addictions are broken. May God rise up and release his people from addiction. Lord, in your mercy. Those who are in, we are in minister part partnership with, LCMC, Pastor Bob Mankaka of the Congo, Pastor Seaman Hamer of Estonia, Pastor Enrique Estrada of Monterey, Mexico. Bring us the opportunity to connect with them at the LCMC annual gathering this week in Missouri and bless the gathering that it be a time to reconnect with you and each other within this association. Lord, in your mercy. Pray for all pastors and their spouses serving in God's churches. Prayers for the country of Ukraine and for the work of the Spiritual Orphan Net Network. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we cry out to you for those who we now mention out loud or in the silence of our hearts.
Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you in your Son's holy and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. I got a phone call from Pastor Sandy, also this week, about her daughters. One's experiencing illness. Her, right, the whole right side, I think, that she said. And then the other one um, has a continuation of an ear, something that's not performed correctly, and it's continuous on So please be in prayer for, uh, for the whole family, I guess, for the daughters as well. I know God loves them, I know that. So as recipients of our abundant life in Jesus Christ, we now offer our gifts to God. Jesus was betrayed and took bread. And after he gave thanks to his Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And after he gave thanks to his Father, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is new covenant in my blood shed for you. For the forgiveness of your sins, do this in remembrance of me.
Christ's body and blood strengthen you. And give you your divine peace. Amen. Let us pray. Nourished at this table, O God, may we know Christ to be in love and we are one and we are in Him. Help us to recognize our Lord Jesus and for breaking of bread to see and serve Him with valuable people. Give us for our bread and the grace to share our bread of the hungry of the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes and find our glory. That we may have peace with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ our Lord and Lord of the universe, Almighty Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As you have been fed at this table, now go and feed the hungry. As you've been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the eternal blessing that you have received from the Father, the Son, and His Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us worship. This is Psalm, Psalm 130. We're going to sing now.
the storm and through the night. Amen. Go in the peace and the comfort and the assurance of our Lord to love and serve the Lord and his creation. God is with us. Thanks be to God.